Uh, the, I, I'm, I'm likely to say many things that people in this audience already know, but I think um, it's nonetheless helpful to, to go over these things. Uh, it's an important topic because along with cognitive symptoms, um, these are the two domains of symptoms which account for the majority of the disability associated with schizophrenia. Um, to just sort of summarize what I'm going to do as take home points, um, pay attention to the negative symptoms, uh, try not to worsen cognition, prioritize physical health, uh, identify inherent strengths, um, be multimodal in treatment, in other words, don't focus solely on pharmacotherapy, and um, develop plans to um, refine medications to the most effective. <clears throat> and Jamie, can you move up the bar from the screen? So just a overall definition of negative symptoms. Uh, this is taken directly from the thing called the PANS. PANS stands for Positive and Negative Symptom Scale. This is essentially one of the gold standard symptom rating scales that's used in the majority of clinical research on schizophrenia. So if you're a drug company and want to test effectiveness of a medicine, or if you're a psychologist and want to test the, the effectiveness of a psychological intervention, um, odds are that you'll use the PANS as your measure of effectiveness. Uh, so the PANS, as the name implies, addresses both positive and negative symptoms. Negative symptoms in the PANS are specifically these items. Um, they tap into affect, emotional withdrawal, um, deficits in rapport, um, abstract thinking. I don't usually think of abstract thinking as a negative symptom, but nonetheless, PANS does include it in that. Uh, lack of spontaneity and stereotype thinking. And there are blunted affect, emotional withdrawal, poor rapport, um, apathy in social situations. Those to me sound like depression, and I'm now going to talk about there is significant overlap, both in terms of symptoms, genetics, and pharmacology between negative symptoms and depression. Uh, symptom overlap I sort of alluded to. Uh, social withdrawal, apathy, blunting of emotions, those are um, it, reminiscent of depression. I got, I went out of order in my slides. Um, I wanted to also, before I elaborate about overlap and depression symptoms, one could just um, highlight something that is not often taught in, in textbooks, um, but is worth knowing. Primary symptoms can be parsed in, into so-called primary and secondary negative symptoms. They look the same. So affective blunting or social withdrawal, it, it is the same appearance to an outward observer, whether this is primary or secondary. Uh, this may be one of the reasons why it's not widely taught, because it's difficult to recognize from observation. However, um, it's thought that that negative symptom could be the result of inherent biology or neurobiology, so is directly related to a primary illness process, um, or it could be secondary to illness or its treatment. So if illness has caused me to reduce my social network um, and I'm feeling um, apathetic about social interactions because I have so few of them, that would actually be a secondary cause of social apathy. Um, if my antipsychotic medication is excessively blocking my pleasure-producing dopamine receptors, um, and I have affective blunting because of excessive dopamine blockade, that would be an example of the secondary symptoms. So uh, secondary symptoms are related to identifiable or suspected um, outward causes. Um, <clears throat> as far as the neurobiology of, of the negative symptoms, I would say that it, it, it's, Many, many ideas are speculative and they tend to revolve around um, decreased activity of the frontal cortex. Um, pretty much primarily, it's thought related to deficiencies of dopamines, dopamine um, innervation in that area or as a secondary re result of frontal cortex um, disactivation uh, due to other neurobiological circuits. Uh, psychological theories are easier to grasp, and I like them because they actually suggest treatments. Uh, it turns out that if you look at personality inventories of, of people with schizophrenia, and if you get them before they develop the illness, 
on average, they have a tendency to be um, introverted, uh, to be avoidant, and um, quite often um, individuals with, before they have schizophrenia, will have difficulties in academic and social settings. So if you take those pre-morbid um, performance impairments or challenges, and you combine that toward uh, with, with, with personality traits of introversion and self-criticism, uh, then you have a recipe for perpetuating this as psychosis uh, unfolds. Um, if, a, if a default coping skill has been to, to for coping skill has been to withdraw from situations, uh, then having active psychosis will perhaps lead one to double down on that. Um, and as one becomes withdrawn from the world and its challenges, then one loses the opportunity to have new experiences that will challenge those assumptions. So if I uh, tend to think that it's safe to be withdrawn um, and I therefore withdraw, I have little opportunity to experience success when I am engaged with the world. Um, so this becomes self-reinforcing. Um, Pat Deegan is a person uh, who has lived experience with schizophrenia, and she, especially, she, she essentially um, outlines this in this prose um, as a result of her illness combined with um, a tendency toward um, cutting off or withdrawing. It became a reinforcing cycle. And so now to dispel a common psychological belief, it's, it's thought that people with schizophrenia simply um, are neurologically or neurochemically uh, impaired in their ability to experience pleasure. That's actually not supported by data. Um, it, it, if, if I give a big party and I invite a person without and a person with schizophrenia to my party, uh, or if I invite 10 of each group, um, and I ask them at the end, how would you rate your, your pleasure from my party, they'll score approximately the same. So, being, so it's not a deficit primarily in experience of pleasure. It is rather the ability to forecast pleasure. So if my party invitations go out to 10 people without schizophrenia, they are likely to rate the anticipated pleasure as very high because they figure I throw good parties. Um, if I give it out to 10 people with schizophrenia, they're likely to um, underrate the expected um, pleasure or excitement from my party. So it's, it's a, if you don't anticipate pleasure, then you have a hard time organizing your life around trying to attain pleasure. And uh, in this phrasing, it's a cognitive problem more than a chemical problem that can explain uh, social withdrawal and, um, and related, related uh, things. So coming back to depression, I talked about the symptomatic overlap. Um, it, it turns out that uh, if you look at a meta-analysis of a fairly large body of work, giving people with schizophrenia antidepressant medication actually is helpful. Um, overall, across all symptoms, like general PAN score, you get an effect size of 0.3 to 0.6, which I, I, is not too shabby um, as effect sizes go. As a review, um, effect size is a way that you can compare the strength of an effect or the strength of a relationship um, across different studies, um, even across different classes. Um, the number has the same meaning whether we're comparing the average height of NBA basketball players to average height of high school players or comparing the average effectiveness of clozapine to the average effectiveness of aripiprazole. Um, the number is, is, is sort of quantified bigness or degree of effectiveness. And for antipsychotic drugs, as well as for antidepressant drugs, um, their effect size at the symptoms that they target range from 0.4 to 0.6. Um, this is a slide I use to illustrate that. And by the way, clozapine has a monstrously large effect size uh, of about 0.9. 0.9 for comparison is about the effect size of amphetamines on treating ADHD. So, this is simply to give you a reference point. So when I say antidepressants have an average effect size of 0.3 to 0.6, that actually compares in the ballpark with the effectiveness of antipsychotic medications um, on schizophrenia symptoms. Um, so antidepressants are a generally recommended adjunctive medication, um, and they have efficacy at reducing negative symptoms as well as uh, uh, positive symptoms, kind of surprisingly. 
another strategy to reduce negative symptoms, at least secondary negative symptoms, is to um, uh, systematically reduce the dose of medications to achieve the lowest effective dose. Uh, as a reminder, antipsychotic medications are geared toward blocking dopamine receptors. Dopamine is a reward signal, so blocking its receptors uh, is a good way to create a secondary um, apathy or a motivation syndrome. Um, and the, it's a commonly reported occurrence among clinicians that as they begin to reduce the dose of medications, they can often still maintain remission from psychotic symptoms, but they will find that what looked like severe negative symptoms actually starts to uh, improve significantly. Um, and just as a reminder about dosing, the bottom line is that most of the drugs that we use at the recommended doses are probably overdosed. Um, certainly we can say they're adequately dosed. We have a pretty good idea from looking at PET studies that you need to block between 40% to 70% of D2 receptors to get antipsychotic response. Um, this is a dose occupancy curve for, um, for uh, olanzapine. And you'll see at the 20 milligram dose that you've achieved that 70% mark. So doses above 20 milligrams are probably not going to be um, proportionally more helpful. Um, also notice as you move down to 10 milligrams, you're still on average at 60% blockade. And even at five milligrams, you're in the 50% blockade. And 50% to 60% blockade of D2 receptors is for many patients sufficient to maintain symptom remission. So um, this graph, this graph is in line with what is clinically experienced when people have remitted with a medicine like, well, specifically when they've remitted with Cyprexa, um, and after six or more months, the clinician begins to walk down the dose, many people maintain remission of symptoms at five milligrams per day. This graph explains why, that's, why, that, why that can be feasible. Uh, and similar, just another for reference, for reference paper, uh, dose occupancy curve of risperidone at D2 receptors, and at two milligrams, you've achieved 60% occupancy. So um, historically, we've been taught um, for a variety of reasons to prescribe higher doses. This is just letting you know that as you walk the doses down to five milligrams of Zyprexa or two milligrams of Risperidone, you're still um, targeting dopamine receptors with sufficient force to reasonably expect that you can maintain remission. Um, oh, and one more curve. This is for, for Erica Brazal. This is a really remarkable curve. If you look at 10 milligrams and 30 milligram doses, you achieve maximal occupancy. Um, you've actually got two, you've actually hit the 70% mark of T2 receptor occupancy at a two milligram oral dose. Um, so again, once people have maintained remission, um, walking down the dose uh, is, is safer than many people uh, might imagine. Um, and cognitive remediation. I'm going to talk more about cognitive symptoms next week. Uh, cognitive remediation is basically a drill and practice scenario um, where I will do memory games, reaction time games. Yeah, I say games because they're done on computers. Uh, so a computer will take me through cognitive tasks, often in game form, uh, meant to uh, strengthen my memory, reaction time, uh, processing speed, and so forth. And when you do this, you actually have reasonably good effect size at reducing negative symptoms. It also boosts cognitive symptoms, um, which is what it was designed to do. And um, a not, not well described, not, not as systematically described in the literature, but a very useful clinical strategy is to try to address the defect in hedonic forecasting. So the primary deficit is um, I am limited in my ability to accurately predict pleasure. So similar to cognitive rem remediation, let's set up a strategy where let's predict your excitement, let's predict your satisfaction of going out a walk in a park. Like right now, I expect that's going to be like a three on a level on a 10 point scale of satisfaction. Let's have you go ahead and do that walk in the park. And then once you do that, you might find out that it's a five or a six. So if you practice this again and again, the patient can begin to learn that to, to trust um, experience rather than their imagination of experience. And that will, that will help. 
Um, there's also, I like to call it deliberate cultivation of positive experience. So if you can have somebody engaged in something that's deliberately pleasurable on a regular basis, you begin to uh, effectively train the brain that um, pleasure is an achievable goal. Um, there was a very interesting pilot study, which I talked with Dr. Johnson about how this went and it wasn't continued because it didn't garner funding. The pilot didn't get NIH funding for continued, which is sad because it had an effect size of 1.7 on negative symptoms through, through a modified meditative technique uh, which was geared, which was secularized and geared toward cultivating positive emotion and positive self-talk. Um, it was a relatively small investment in time and it had a very large effect on negative symptoms. Um, and a clinician from, from a, a, a clinician colleague um, emailed me one time in response to hearing that data and this clinician wrote about the the most difficult case that he had ever worked with um, many many years of fairly poor functioning um, and the clinician had heroically uh, treated with all manner of reasonable medications uh, there was a talent contest in the in the city and a case manager encouraged the patient to try out for that knowing that the patient had some interest in singing from earlier in life. Uh, with encouragement, the patient then did engage in this talent show, got tremendous amount of positive feedback from the audience and from everybody else. And as this um, psychiatrist wrote, um, as I look back at it, I did nothing with medications. Um, it was tapping into the inherent interests, matching them with experience that, um, in the psychiatrist's word, did more good than anything else. So, General uh, summary for pharmacotherapy or for general treatment strategy, less medication, uh, certainly lowering the dose of antipsychotic medications to the minimal effective dose. Um, overall, reducing polypharmacy is a great goal. Uh, there is an exception. Uh, we talked about polypharmacy a bit last week, and the other exception to the polypharmacy rule is antidepressants on average are helpful um, because, well, because they are. I imagine that part of this is because there is this substantial genetic and phenomenological overlap between depression and schizophrenia. Uh, so less medication, more action. By more action, I mean behavioral activation, um, doing these exercises to challenge uh, defective hedonic forecasting, um, and, and, and things that will deliberately cultivate positive experiences, or that will help people to just engage in small successes. Um, if a person is saying, I can't get out of bed until noon every day, then maybe even set up a bit of a game slash challenge to see if they can make it out of bed by 11, um, just two times in a week. And if they do, that's cause for celebration. I call it win early, win often. That can sort of set up a, um, set up a positive feedback cycle where maybe next week we'll go for three days out of seven where we get out of bed before 11. Um, because even though it may seem to us a very small goal to somebody that's been essentially bedridden, um, that is actually significant improvement and is the groundwork for, uh, for, for further gains. Um, overall, that strategy in psychology is called broaden and build. So you will start to expand uh, a bit of your repertoire, um, forming a base from which you can then um, add more, add more tricks and successes. Um, so. So uh, I guess to, to also summarize, uh, we know very little about the neurobiology and neurochemistry underlying negative symptoms. We know a lot about the psychology around that. And so thinking of negative symptoms from a psychological frame and treatment from that frame is probably going to be a higher yield um, strategy than uh, looking for uh, medication solutions at this point in our knowledge. So that